Uh, before I speak to the uh, synthesis and the insights from this scenarios project, let me please acknowledge uh, some key players in this. It was a collective effort by a network of nearly four dozen researchers who held at least 10 different workshops, conducted literally hundreds of interviews, analyzed thousands of survey responses, and reviewed thousands of pages of literature. But there are three people in particular who were absolutely instrumental to both the report and to the experience that you've all had today. First of all is Louise Naudio, who played a key role in copy editing the report. In fact, it went far beyond merely copy editing, and many of her insights are integrated into the report. The beautiful design of this report, all credit for that goes to Elsa Bleed Gelderblum, uh, who did a fantastic job. She's also designed all of the graphics that you see around the room, uh, the media banner, and Kathy Page Wood of Farm Design, who's been responsible for organizing the look and feel of the uh, scenarios breakout rooms and uh, for organizing the dramatization of the scenarios. So not all of them are here, but I'd like to just uh, give them a round of applause for those who are, and so they can see it on the video how truly grateful uh, we, we are. I also want to uh, acknowledge Caroline Kube, uh, wherever she is, for her wonderful job facilitating today. It uh, would not have been the same experience without your skillful moderation and facilitation, so thank you very much. And, uh, and, and finally, the Open Air Project's core funders, GIZ and IDRC, uh, who invested in the idea of a scenarios research exercise uh, more than three years ago, and so uh, we hope that you're as happy as we are with the results of, of, the, of the analysis. So, um, with that, let me talk a little bit about the synthesis of the scenarios that you've uh, been, been engaged with all day. And I want to speak in particular about the issue of intellectual property in all of these scenarios. Because after all, that's what, um, that's what the focus of our open air project is on, and that's what the focus of the Global Congress is about. It's the role of intellectual property. Now, um, we've actually stepped back from intellectual property as a term on the title of the scenarios and as an analytical term, and we speak instead of knowledge governance. And knowledge governance is a more sophisticated way of understanding what intellectual property does. Uh, I'm actually humbled to be speaking before Peter Drehosh, one of the key people in the, in the world who coined this idea uh, of knowledge governance in his book with John Braithwaite, uh, Information Feudalism. And it's very much that concept that we've been working uh, with, and so he'll speak right after me. Uh, for those of you who would like to follow along, in your scenarios report, I direct you to pages 134 and 135. Throughout the day, we've presented a flow uh, through this scenarios document, starting with uh, the open air network and what the open air network is all about, moving through to uh, discussions of, of the importance of perspectives, talking about drivers of change, and then being fully immersed in the, in the scenarios. Now, um, it's my job, it's my privilege to tie together some of our insights and analysis. I have to preface that by saying the key point of the scenarios is to actually facilitate your own insights and analysis and that it's your opinions and your reactions to these scenarios that really matter. What we've tried to do is to create a tool, a heuristic, to allow you to think differently about the world, to provoke you to consider issues that you may not have considered before and to challenge yourself intellectually um, and strategically that it may not be uh, business as usual in the future as you expect. So on pages 134 and 135, we summarize three issues, uh, key insights that have come from our network of nearly four dozen researchers around three topics. First of all, in each of these scenarios, what kind of knowledge is valuable? What knowledge holds value? Second, in each of these scenarios, what do innovation systems look like? Erica spoke to us yesterday on a panel about the importance of innovation systems in the informal sector, but innovation systems are a core concept across all of these scenarios. So what do they look like in these different scenarios? And third and finally, what is knowledge governance about in each of these three scenarios? So let me begin 
with the scenario wireless engagement. Now, we think that the kind of knowledge that is likely to have value in this scenario is knowledge that is globally generalizable. If Africa is engaged in a global service-oriented economy, the business opportunities are going to involve data that is codified and commodifiable. And standardization will be extremely important because the opportunities that exist will be opportunities to tie into global technological and economic platforms. The key to success is going to be what you know and whether you know enough to tap into these global opportunities. You need technical and legal skills and the managerial ability to engage in global commerce and especially electronic commerce. And it's most likely that that education and those skills will be obtained through formal education systems or through self-learning using online tools, MOOCs for example. Now the innovation systems in this environment are going to be based on products and services that can leverage widely used technological platforms. The internet, for example, but even particular applications on the internet or on mobile devices. This is a world of generating apps for opportunities. The enterprises that drive economic progress in this environment are very likely to be large or medium-sized transnational corporations. In the scenarios, you'll read that many of these transnational corporations are based in African countries, but they do business globally. Now, the type of innovation system that may prevail in this situation is a system modeled on either proprietary or open innovation systems, and which will predominate is highly uncertain. And in fact, there's almost, almost sure to be a tension, a continued tension between open and proprietary models. Now, one of the key points in this scenario is that open does not mean open access for everyone. Open means that opportunities are open to you in this environment if you're able to set or comply with dominant technological standards, legal standards, or economic standards. And if you're able to set or comply with those standards, this is a wor world where you will be included. But if you're on the other side of the digital divide, you may be highly marginalized. So the type of knowledge governance system that we're likely to see in a scenario of wireless engagement is a knowledge governance system that is highly formal. It's standardized and it's likely to remain controversial. The key kinds of legal rights, intellectual property rights that are likely to be most relevant in this scenario, not that they're irrelevant in other scenarios, or that other rights aren't also relevant, but the key rights are likely to be copyrights, patents, utility models, scholarly publications as a mode of knowledge governance, trademarks and branding are likely to be important, as are industrial designs. That's the world of wireless engagement. In a world of informal as the new normal, we're looking at a significantly different kind of knowledge that is valuable. The knowledge that's valuable in this environment is not standardized or codified. It's highly contextual, and it's tacit, and it's contingent, and it's instinctive, and it depends on your trusted relationships at the base of the pyramid. What matters is not what you know, but who you know. Because in this world, trust and reputation are everything. So that's the kind of knowledge that matters. And you may not acquire that knowledge from formal education systems or online materials. You may acquire that knowledge through apprenticeships, vocational training, improvisation. Now, the innovation system here is quite likely to be driven by users, individual entrepreneurs, and micro-enterprises, not medium or large-sized multinational enterprises. Innovation will be based on improvisation, small-scale solutions that adapt existing or foreign strategies to local problems. This is not unsophisticated. It's exactly the opposite. It's very advanced, but it solves locally relevant problems. It's modeled on a term called grassroots innovation or user innovation, uh, like scholars such as Eric von Hippel have been talking about. And it's about innovation at the base of the pyramid. Now, this world is not an open world. Simply because innovation is driven by users, it's not necessarily open. 
This world is open to you if you have trusted social networks in a close geographic proximity. In order to be included in this world, you need to know the people that matter. And if you don't, if you're not trusted, you're going to be excluded. So for businesses or civil society groups who foresee a world like this, you need to start building those trusted relationships and grassroots social network now because that is how you'll succeed in a world where informal is normal in 2035. This knowledge governance system is different. It's not about copyrights or patents or utility models. This knowledge governance system is interpersonal. It's highly dynamic and it's very pragmatic. Knowledge is governed by the ability to improvise. The complexity of your product, that's how you stop competitors in the informal sector. You have a complex product that can't be reverse engineered. Secrecy, trade secrecy, is the intellectual property right that matters most in the informal sector. First mover advantage is incredibly important, and customer loyalty is important. Moral rights, but maybe not moral rights in the sense that we as copyright lawyers think about it, but moral rights in, in terms of um, attribution and a sense of cultural or social norm. So moral rights won't be enforced because of a fear of a lawsuit for copyright infringement. Moral rights are respected because you value your trust. And losing trust is far more significant a sanction or a consequence than getting sued for copyright infringement. And that's what makes intellectual property rights or moral rights enforceable in a world where informal is the new normal. In a world of Sincerely Africa, the type of knowledge that is important is knowledge that can be leveraged to facilitate sustainable development. Principles matter in this world, and those principles need to serve communities that have common interests. In the world of wireless engagement, what matters is what you know. In the world of informal, the new normal, it's who you know. In a world of Sincerely Africa, it's who you are that matters. It's your identity. And your identity may be connected to a geographic location or a specific region, but it may be connected to spiritual values, an ethnic identity, a common culture. The diaspora is likely to play a very important role here. Simply because you may be geographically disconnected doesn't mean that you're not part of a community. And that is what makes knowledge valuable in this situation. Intergenerational awareness is key. Ecological, spiritual, and scientific skills and knowledge. Doing more with less. That's what's important. So there is innovation in this world, in the world of Sincerely Africa. It's not back to the Stone Age. That's not it at all. Rather, the type of innovation that matters is innovation that embodies a holistic appreciation of long-term social and cultural and economic and ecological actions and reactions. There's a system here, and the system really matters. The type of economic actors and economic enterprises are not likely to be multinational corporations or transnational corporations or micro-enterprises. Rather, we believe that we'll be looking at ethnocentric partnerships and cooperative ventures as a dominant mode of economic organization. The type of innovation that happens here will be modeled on gradual innovation and sustainable innovation among well-established communities. This world is also open, but only in a way. This world is open if you belong to a group that shares common cultural or spiritual or ethnic or other identities and values. That's how you get included in this world. And the knowledge governance system here is traditional. It's sacred and it's hierarchical. Systems are governed by customary norms over traditional knowledge, and those may be reinforced by international or national legal systems, but those systems only have credibility if they reinforce customary and traditional values. That's the key to success in terms of a legal framework. Traditional knowledge, benefit sharing, geographic indication, certification schemes. We see these are all likely to be important in a world of Sincerely Africa. Now, I need to emphasize that these scenarios overlap. <clears throat> Africa, as we were at pains to stress at the beginning of the day, is not a homogenous entity. The, the concept exists only as a geographic fiction. Uh, the concept of the fiction, it's a, it's a geographic region, not a, not a country. 
Similarly, these scenarios don't exist except in overlapping systems. They may exist for different people in the same place. Different people in the same place may actually be experiencing one or more of these systems or see the world through one or more of these lenses. They may exist in different places. Some countries may look more like one or another scenario. Particular regions of the same country may look more like one scenario or another. They overlap. And so what we tried to do at the very end of the scenarios building exercise was to reflect on what kind of knowledge governance systems matter in which scenario. The first task to make that feasible was to move beyond a narrow-minded legal conception of what intellectual property rights are and what intellectual property rights matter. So on page 131, you'll see we've reproduced uh, or produced this, um, this graphic. 131, I think, is the page. I want you just to have a look at it. We explain in more detail what all of this means at the beginning of the scenarios on pages 18 and 19. You can read our network's perspective on knowledge governance. So have a look at the bottom of this figure, legal formality, ranging from very informal protections on one end through semi-formal protections uh, to formal protections. So very often we as IP lawyers think of knowledge governance just along this axis. It's a very, frankly, one-dimensional one um, view. But legal formality is not the only thing that matters about knowledge governance. The structure of knowledge also matters. So look at the top of the graphic. You can map knowledge from tacit knowledge all the way to codified knowledge. Some knowledge is, is tacit, other knowledge is codified. And if you start to look at the vertical axes here, the specificity of knowledge is significant. Some knowledge is generalizable. It applies in a variety of different circumstances. Other knowledge is highly contextual. The knowledge changes, the knowledge matters depending on who you are or where you are. Think of the example of, re of riding a bicycle. Riding a bicycle is tacit knowledge. Most people don't need to read a book to know how to do it. And it's highly generalizable. Most people ride a bicycle the same way no matter where they are in the world. Tacit, highly generalizable knowledge. Compare that to reading the Bible. Reading the Bible is reading codified knowledge, but it's very contextual. Different people approach the same codified knowledge very differently, depending on where they are or who they are. And so this is the kind of analytical insight that we think the intellectual property community needs to start thinking about, beyond the one dimension of legal formality, and to start thinking about whether no valuable knowledge is tacit or codified, or generalizable or contextual. Or on the other vertical axis, what kind of knowledge are we talking about? What's the object of knowledge? Is it know who that matters? Is it know how that matters? Or is what matters what you know or why you know it? Know what and know why. In disciplines outside of law, when they look at innovation systems and knowledge governance, this is a commonly used dichotomy. So what we've done here is we've actually put all four of these together in a four-dimensional matrix. And what you see when you map these four dimensions against each other is that certain kinds of knowledge matter in different kinds of scenarios. So look at the far lower right. We've got product patents and we've got scholarly publications. If you move up the figure a little bit to process patents and manuals and handbooks, industrial designs. Some of these are about know why, some are know who or know how, and all of these are legal, legally formalized and codified. The um, economically valuable types of knowledge in certain environments is generalizable knowledge because you can scale it and you can sell it to other people. That's why product patents are valuable. But if what matters is not generalizable knowledge, but highly contextual tacit knowledge, look at the opposite corner. What matters there is customer loyalty. You don't get that knowledge 
or customer loyalty through scholarly publications. You acquire that through apprenticeships. And you protect your knowledge through trade secrets and improvisation. Okay? These are informal, oftentimes tacit and contextual forms of who you know or what you know. The structure of knowledge is sometimes somewhere between tacit and codified knowledge. And if you look at the world of Sincerely Africa, it sort of envelops these types of knowledge governance systems that are between wireless engagement and informal, the new normal. What matters in this are semi-formal legal protections or legal pr protections that are enforced by customary norms as opposed to strict formal legal rules. Traditional knowledge and access and benefit sharing. You see geographic indications and certification schemes. Now, in a world of Sincerely Africa, it doesn't mean that copyrights are irrelevant. Similarly, moral rights and trademarks, these may be relevant in various scenarios. They're shades that overlap with each other. But the key takeaway message here is that using this heuristic, this, this analytical tool of the scenarios, helps us to think differently about the way we approach the topics that we've all been working on for many years and will continue to work on for many years in the future. So the main objective of the open air scenarios has been to facilitate a different mindset. To take you back to where Shireen began in the morning, how a map is a mindset, and you can see three overlapping maps. These scenarios are three overlapping scenarios. And all of these perspectives, none of these perspectives are right, none are wrong, none are certain to occur, none are impossible. And so your perspective matters. The map that we've provided for you in the open air scenarios will hopefully influence you and your mindset um, in your future work. And so that's the open air scenarios. And I'd like to welcome uh, Professor Peter Dreosh uh, to talk about the issue of responsive regulation, uh, which is a very fitting topic in this context.